yeah, so I get to summarize between us and the break. And I guess what it feels to me is that we've been listening today to really this fundamental part of CSER, which is this ability to focus both on the tools and how we need to improve the tools, but both also focus on the delivery, recognizing that that is really, I think, a synergistic integration that CSER has specialized in to both keep in our mind the need to develop the tools, the methods of the tools, but also to focus on the delivery side. I have to say I'm not completely sure how I became a payer. Um, <laughs> I certainly spent a lot of time uh, dealing with payers on the contractual side, I will say. But I think thinking about payers can be useful, although I would argue that actually, and I'm going to tell a short story and then come back to the last point that I want to make, because I think it summarizes a lot of what we've heard, that to a great extent, payers are responding to what they hear from us. Um, one of my mentors was a guy named Bob Brook, who was a faculty member at UCLA and a health economist. And he tells a story about going to Davos a long time ago and being put on a panel that was supposed to tell most of the big companies and the governments who had deep pockets what to do about HIV. This is HIV was just coming out in Africa. And he said he sat on a panel of about 12 individuals and said by the third individual, it was very clear that every single person on the panel was disagreeing and had their own point of view about what should be done. And he said that he watched the people in the audience with the deep pockets who in the beginning were incredibly worried that they were going to have to cough up a lot of money to save, um, to do something. He said by the fourth person, everybody in that room had relaxed and was realizing that if the panelists couldn't figure out what the right thing was to do, then it was very unlikely that this was going to put them on the spot. And I think as we think about the delivery side, Caesar has a huge opportunity here, I think, to take on what are the things that we think are right on the delivery side. I often, when I talk about this, and I think as we think about it, Dave, and listening to what you guys are talking about, you know, I think the Institute of Medicine in 2002 defined for us what healthcare quality is. And I think CSER has done an immense amount in thinking about how the use of sequencing can be safe, how the use of sequencing can be effective, how the use of sequencing, and I think what you guys are talking about is really the efficiency domain, right? So how do we bring value into it? How do we start to argue what is the efficient use of sequencing to achieve healthcare quality? I will say the prior session, I think it was, I've lost track a little bit of the order here, but we think about it, I think equity is an enormous part of where CSER needs to go to understand how healthcare delivery, when we think about the use of sequencing, should be equitable. Patient-centered, we heard about, and the need to include patient organizations, patient groups, to ensure that what we're doing is patient-centered. Timely, I think we talked about, I can't remember which group it is that now has their turnaround down to two weeks, but that's pretty good. Um, and I think I've one dimension that didn't come up in the IOM quality chasm was really the ethical dimensions. And I think for CSER, that's been an enormous part. So I would say my summary in listening to you guys is that we're really at a time where you are taking on how not just to make the tools better, but how to make the delivery better. And I guess I would just end by saying that most of the discussion we're hearing is that just as there was a need, I think, to really invest in the methods for developing better tools, we now have to really make better methods for making delivery better. And so we've heard about the challenges in those methods, I think, here. The measures that we struggle with, the sample sizes, the need to include families, the need to actually be able to study the value of when does it make a difference to find a diagnosis and when doesn't. How do we use observational large data? We talked about the optum data. Lots of data we can start to use to really develop better methods to study the cascade. What does that mean? When and how do we decide what we're doing and what the outcomes are of that? And I just finished by saying that um, I don't know how many of you guys saw the Wall Street Journal today. It's been up by, have people seen it? It's been up by uh, the coffee place where I've been several times, I will say. Um, and I think it's a striking Wall Street Journal for several different reasons because it really does highlight I think where we are. So it obviously talks, and I think uh, uh, we heard this morning that Lucia talked about it has an article in it about a family undergoing sequencing, but it also actually reports the results of the Taylor RX trial, which came out today in the New England Journal, which essentially showed that the use of gene expression paneling actually in a group of women with breast cancer could reduce the use of chemotherapy 
and had the same outcomes for those individuals. I will say it also talks about the fact that came up earlier that it says that by, I'm, I'm going to forget the exact date, but by 2050, that 88% of our population growth is going to be immigrants. And that actually Asian populations, to make your point, Gail, are going to be the largest growth in our immigrant populations. And that for us to actually make a difference on the delivery or the tool side, that we have to take on the particular issues of what our population will be. So thank you very much.